So now we have Emily Dickinson's uh, poem 556, The Brain Within Its Groove. This is a very difficult poem. We're going to spend a lot of time with it. So I want us to do a close reading together. So Max, you have the brain. All right. Amaris, you have groove. Uh, OK, Molly runs evenly and true. So you have all, that whole line there. Okay. All right. And Anna, will you help her with that? Mm -hmm. All right. Ali, uh, you and Dave have this very difficult idea of the splinter swerving. And um, Emily, you have this whole thing about the current, the flood, all that stuff. Very, very difficult stuff. And um, you, can, you, can, you also have the turnpike. You have all that stuff. Okay. I'm Maurice, you have the word trodden. And uh, Max will be back to you for mills. Okay. Okay. All right. The brain within its grief. <coughs> Max, tell us about the brain. Uh, the brain is uh, the seat of all of our thought um, and maybe also our consciousness, but I guess that would be debatable. Um, it's typically thought of in opposition to the heart. Um, okay, so um, thinking with, uh, with a slight connotation of passionless, that is, it's intellection. intellection. Yes, it's, 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 it's rational. We think of it as, as rational. rational. Okay, and you don't, you don't really know which connotation works here because we haven't really been through the poem, but your, no. guess, your guess as to what she means here? Which connotation of the brain? Yeah, you've only given us a couple. Can you give us a couple more connotations of the brain? Anna will help you. Anna, what's another context for the brain? If I ever use the word brain, what do I mean? Well, you could talk about uh, brain or brains versus brawn as kind of like a... Okay, like another, another version of the kind of brain of heart. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Completely different context, anybody? Brain, the physical thing that's residing in the head. Why, Max, the brain? Why the brain? As opposed to brains or a brain? She's talking about uh, the brain in, in general, I guess, the, the, the human brains or, or it's funny anyone's how the brain. Article the, brain. if put in front of something that could be thought of as, I don't want to say abstract, but generalizable, becomes more general. A yeah, brain. Absolutely. So this brain, or the particular brain, the brain that is in your head, Max, uh, is specific. A brain is a little more general. And then the brain can be, folks, we are now today going to talk about the brain, says mm -hmm. the anatomy teacher. OK. Which do you oh. think it is? It's probably the latter, huh? Yeah. The brain. The brain generally, within its groove, runs evenly and true. I believe. It's Amaris who has groove. Mm -hmm. Are you groovy? <laughs> I'm groovy. Are you? Is that a connotation that's relevant here? No, um, not at all. In fact, Emily quite the, the opposite. Not groovy. <laughs> <laughs> um, this has much more of a linear connotation. I have an image in my head of the brain being cradled within this normal or natural line of reasoning. Um, following its, its tendencies. So it's not a reference to the physical brain in the cranium that's in a groove, although my brain in the head is in the groove of my neck and collarbone. That's true. It sits there on top of the spine. She's not referring to that. What's she referring to? Um, thought process. Thought process. So it's not the brain as a physical object. It's the brain that creates thought. And thought in a groove is like what? Um, well, if you're following the image, um, it could be If you're following her, her conceit, the metaphor she's getting to, mm -hmm. let's not go there yet. Okay. Um, if I, I were to say, say that your thought following is... Following assumptions, prejudices, anything that the brain is sort of surrounded by or armed with to attack an unknown issue. Okay. Maybe stuck in, if you wanted to go there. Stuck in. If my brain is in a groove, it's either a positive connotation... I'm doing well thinking on, an, on a train of thought. Ah, train of thought, right? Groove. What's the negative connotation? Well, if you're, if you're stuck in one particular line of thinking, it could close you off to other. So an, a synonym for groove in that sense would be rut. It would be rut, yeah. OK, the brain within the, We don't know yet if di this Dickinson poem is going to create a negative connotation for the brain in its groove. We don't know yet. But that seems to, anything to add to that, Amaris? The brain within its groove? Mm -hmm. So it's definitely not groove as in Michael Jackson when he's just hit that song and 
who knows how he pulled that off. Or another Michael, Michael Jordan, when he's figured out how to improvise his way around four guys who are taller than he is, and he, I don't know how he does that. He's, they say he's playing out of his head, is that what we say? Or out of his mind. Out of his mind. He's, that is, the thought has been supplanted by something else. That's kind of groovy, but that's not what is meant here, apparently. Okay, the brain within its groove runs evenly and true. Is that Molly? It is. Uh, and I think of true as being very, very straight uh, and evenly as being sort of this very smooth, regular tempo. So it's just this very... Can you circular. think of something in our lives that runs evenly? Using those, that idiom, runs evenly? Uh, some type of machine, I a guess, machine. or a wheel. A machine, sure. When a, an engine, we say the engine of a car runs evenly, and when it runs not evenly, what's wrong? Well, your car is breaking down. You need to go get it repaired, and the guy at the, or gal at the fix-it station, or whatever <laughs> we call them these days, is going to say, well, we need your car to run evenly, because you don't want it to run unevenly. And, when, and evenly refers probably to the pistons and the mechanisms, the, you know, the armature of the motion. You don't want it to be shaking. Okay, the word true is loaded. When Emily Dickinson uses the word true or truth, she's, you're supposed to underline it or highlight it in yellow or something. So it's not just true as you mentioned it. What, what, give us the larger sense of true. Well, not false. I mean, true in the sense of, of being factual, of being real, and being right. So if, if, if Amaris is hinting at a negative connotation for groove, rut, and Anna, the use of true is going to be a real challenge because that would mean that being in a groove is false, is negative. So this is a, she's really loading up the problem here. The brain within its groove runs evenly and true. Um, there seems to be a 19th century metaphor about something that goes down a groove. And it's, it's, a, it's not an automobile, which wouldn't have existed when this poem was written. Something is running evenly down a groove. Any idea? A train. A train. A train. And train works very nicely because the poem seems to be about the train of thought. So a train has no choice but to run down the groove. So when the brain is running like a train, that it seems to say, something is true. And does anybody have a bicycle? Mm -hmm. Dave, what is true in a bicycle? This, this is the last remnant connotation of this word in our language. It's what you do with a, a wheel to make sure it runs completely evenly. It's not off to the side. In fact, when you, when you fix a bike wheel, you actually use the verb true. I've trued this wheel. It's also an adjective to describe the wheel. So this is probably a wheel. It's running evenly and true. But, I didn't assign but, but Al, will you take the word but? The brain within this groove runs evenly and true, but what is she signaling logically? Well, she's kind of saying, but wait, hold up. But wait. So really, Amaris's uh, intuition that we are going to ironize this brain running evenly is right. When you see but, you know something else is going to change. All right. Now, who's got the splinter swerve? This is really hard. I think the two of you. OK, Allie, give us a start on this. But let a splinter swerve. What's going on? First of all, the metaphor is now inconsistent. Because there's no splinter swerving well, a train, I, mean, I don't think. Well, I mean, there could be, because train tracks are partly wood, often. And, so, and okay. you know, wood is the material that splinters. Um, yeah, if you put a giant splinter on a train track, the train will go off the track, although I'm not sure swerve would ever be the word we'd use, because it can't, trains can't swerve. But I respect the point. You're, we're, and, we're, and we're also dealing with someone who likes to slightly shift the metaphor once she gets comfortable with it. Okay, go ahead. Is there anything else you wanted to say about this? Speak your swerve? Not at the moment. Okay, Dave? It's as if she's splintering the metaphor, making it go off on a different track. So you're, you're doing a metapoetic reading. Okay. <coughs> well, all Dickinson poems have to be read metapoetically <laughs> at some point, Allie. Well, also a splinter is an accident. Um, it's unexpected. It's kind of... A nuisance, like kind of uh, unpleasant at the point of impact. Good. So we have something that's interrupting the train of thought. That's really what it is, right? And Amaris, just, just personal, your own personal experience. When you have to do A, you've been assigned to do A, you've got to get, get an A plus in A, 
you've set aside three hours to do A, you sit down to do A, you've been thinking about A, you're getting good at thinking about A, and B shows up. It's extremely unsettling. It's very unsettling. <laughs> and what's it's Emily, comforting. what do you think Emily's saying about B? Um, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Yeah, the unpredictable. And A good. is sort of boring without B. Exactly. Think. Yeah, she's, she's, she's really wanting to move around. And so far, she's allowing this metaphor never to quite settle. She wants to move around in that way, too. All right, Emily, mm -hmm. before we take a break, you tell, you tell us what we're going to do with this next metaphor, which seems not to be about trains anymore. What is it? What's going on? But let a splinter swerve to easier for you to put a current back, current, like a circuit, a current, when floods have slid the hills. What's going on? Well, first she abandoned the two previous conceits, which fits in with the whole idea that thought is sort of irrepressible and uncontrollable. By the way, why would anybody start a poem this short and then abandon already two conceits in the first four lines? <laughs> Well, What's wrong with her? Some way her content, I suppose. Say that again. If it complemented her content somehow, it's making a point. So form and content for Emily Dickinson. That thing, yeah. yeah. But it's just so interesting that she does this because if we think about where we just were with Emily, which is, you know, she's got people closed off. She's in her like impregnable house. I dwell in possibility. Well, in possibility, you know, it's it's almost hard to kind of like reconcile these two poems because. The first one is about how you need to have a certain mentality or, or ability to dwell in possibility. But then this one's kind of all about like letting your mind just take you where your mind is going to go. Well, this poem seems to be uh, an instantiation of the everlasting roof, the sky's the limit. So in a way, in that, way, in that, well, in that well-built house, you've got this limitless, limitlessness. And this seems to be playing that out. It's but you, you're also right. Okay, we'll have to come back to that. But you're, you're also right in suggesting that this is probably a higher level uh, Dickinson poem than the other one. The other is a real intro poem where things are relatively consistent by conceit. And this one, as Emily's reminding us, is a situation where the thing must move in order for its A-ness to be complemented by its B-ness in the example we're talking about. So it's going to get to a C and a D. All right, so what is the metaphor now that seems to be emerging? A current, floods, what's happening there? Well, the metaphor is about water that's sort of uncontrollable. Um, floods in general, water is an incredibly like, irresistible force. It's hard to control. Once it is out of control, we have natural disasters to teach us that. But, um, so we're watching this current explode and sort of do an incredible amount of destruction. The idea is that it can't really be brought back to the same types of controlled structures it was in before. So we've gone from a technology that sends the brain as a metaphor down a certain path. There is no way for the train to find any other route to the station. We've gone from that to something getting in its way, a splinter, which is from a whole other vocabulary. Not typically, although Ali reminded us that there's a way in which the wooden nature of a train track can can cause us to imagine a diversion. But really, splinter comes from somewhere else. Then we've got a swerve, which is not train-like. And now we have a body of water, probably a river. We've got current, and we've got floods. So how is Groovy doing now? Um, well, there is no groove that's visible anymore. I mean, actually, to disagree, unfortunately, with Anna, you're I disagreeing? I, wow. I am. Okay. Um, I would say that we're now flooded with possibility. So all those windows and perspectives that Emily was talking about in Idol and Possibility are now available to both herself and us, the readers. Um, and she isn't, I don't think, shutting anyone out. It's rather a self-enclosure for protection from the eye that would judge or place us back within that group of prejudice. And this is a situation, this is a better poem, in my opinion or at least a more complicated one, because the form must follow its own course, like the water and like the brain. Whereas in the other poem, you really have to get all the way to the end to the narrow hands, the little Dickinsonian modest hands, gathering paradise in, which is enormous. As you get this paradox of small, small we housebound me gathering in enormity. 
Whereas here, you're 